Defining science fiction is not as easy as it seems, and it turns out is enormously problematic. The nature of the difficulties in providing a workable definition for science fiction are highlighted by Patrick Parander, who goes as far to suggest that definitions of science fiction are not so much a series of logical approximations to an elusive ideal as a small parasitic subgenre in themselves. The Concise Oxford Dictionary 10th edition defines the terms science, fiction, and science fiction in the following ways. Science 1. The intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behaviour of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. 2. A systematically organised body of knowledge on any subject. 3. Archaic knowledge. Fiction is then defined as 1. Prose literature, especially novels describing imaginary events and people. 2. Invention as opposed to fact. A false belief or statement accepted as true because such acceptance is considered expedient. Science fiction is then defined as fiction based on imagined future worlds portraying scientific or technological changes. This dictionary definition is far from useful or even remotely correct. The fundamental flaw in its description is the use of the word future, which would discount many science fiction works. The entry on science fiction in the fourth edition of the Dictionary of Literary Terms and Literary Theory is rather lengthy, taking some ten pages to discuss, and is more useful as a brief history and introduction to the genre. It does however present the nature of the beast, highlighting the confusion and uncertainty as to how we go about defining science fiction, stating as to what it is about, this is not easily classifiable. Noting however that they stretch the imagination. One of the first useful definitions of the genre comes from Kingsley Amis, whose Christian Gauss lectures were one of the first proper attempts to look at science fiction literature from a serious academic viewpoint, and discuss it in terms of a subject that is worthy of study. In saying that, Amos's attitude to science fiction comparing it to the development of jazz in New Maps of Hell would be much criticised later, especially by the New Wave and the likes of Michael Moorcock. Amos defines science fiction as follows. Science fiction is that class of prose narrative treating of a situation that could not arise in the world we know, but which is hypothesised on the basis of some innovation in science or technology or pseudo-technology, whether human or extraterrestrial in origin. Kingsley Amos's definition was a useful one, in that it provides a good focal point for heated debate in regards to this so-called parasitic subgenre. Not all science fiction is prose, however, and indeed there is a science fiction poetry association which has been in existence since 1978, and New Worlds magazine published many attempts at science fiction poetry. In addition, situations in science fiction, because they are often extrapolated on or based upon current trends, do arise in the world we know, examples including Frank Herbert's Dracones and Robert Heinlein's Waldos to name just a couple of cases in point. Dracones are the massive inflatable and reusable oil barges developed by Dunlop during the Suez Crisis, which now have a number of technological applications and named after Frank Herbert's The Dragon in the Sea, from which their concept was taken. Heinlein's Waldos are still known by this name today, though the more technical term for them is telefactoring, and again came from his story Waldo, later published as Waldo and Magic Incorporated. Finally, science fiction is not always based upon hypothetical inventions in science and technology, in the same way that it is not always set in the future. These are merely common misconceptions. Although Kingsley Amos's definition is lacking for many reasons, it was certainly useful in that it was one of the first intelligent enough attempts to define science fiction within a broad scope. It also provided the impetus to spark the almost never ending debate to which many writers and critics have waded into over the years. <laughs>
Isaac Asimov was a writer whom Aldous described as being part of the Super League of Science Fiction, and here, discussing definitions in an interview with Mother Earth, explained how John W. Campbell, astounding science fiction and analogued great and controversial editor, saw science fiction and sadly provides us with another unhelpful and rather egotistical viewpoint. John Campbell, the great late editor, said that science fiction stories are those that science fiction editors buy. Isaac Asimov's own definition is a little more helpful, in that it takes us towards a viewpoint that suggests science fiction focuses on the contemporary world of its writers, although it is still focused on technology and science. In the same Mother Earth interview, he tells us his own opinion about science fiction. I think science fiction is the very relevant branch of literature that deals with human response to changes in the level of science and technology, and such writing goes to the heart of matters that trouble us now, because the world is changing at a whirlwind speed. Frank Herbert disagreed vehemently with this kind of science fiction, where science and technology present the solutions to all of mankind's problems without any consideration of the consequences of their implementation. The bulk of science fiction authors, and there are some notable exceptions to this rule, are heavily into what I call the technological toy syndrome. Writers and scientists who believe that technology alone can solve problems have fallen into a common scientific fallacy. The belief that science can answer any question in absolute terms, that it's possible to reduce phenomena to one explanation that will operate in a vacuum. That's not the way the universe appears to me. Robert Heinlein, another of the big four authors, suggested a wide-ranging definition, often fronted for showing science fiction as a form of speculative fiction. Again, although sufficiently broad to cover a great deal of science fiction literature, the aspect of this definition which may preclude some works is the use of the term possible future events. A handy short definition of almost all science fiction might read, realistic speculation about possible future events based solidly on adequate knowledge of the real world, past and present, and on a thorough understanding of the nature and significance of the scientific method. Brian Aldous's definition of science fiction forms the crux of his viewpoint in Trillion Year Spree, and is articulated by him around his decision that Frankenstein was as far as he saw it, the first genuine work of what could be properly called science fiction. Along with Darko Suvin's cognitive estrangement theory and the novum, this would become one of the most popular definitions in our parasitic subgenre. Science fiction is the search for a definition of mankind and his status in the universe, which will stand in our advanced but confused state of knowledge, science, and is characteristically cast in the gothic or post-gothic mould. The nature of science fiction being cast in a post-gothic mould is I think part of the definition which is designed to complement Aldous's theory of science fiction beginning with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. It is sufficiently broad to include a great deal of science fiction, with its concept of mankind's search for his place in the cosmos, but I fundamentally think that it is let down by its attachment to the gothic and post-gothic mould. Aldous saw in the techniques of the gothic writers much that was akin to the following science fiction writers, although his discussion echoes Suvin's cognitive estrangement theory. He sees the similarity in that distance lent enchantment to the view. If something unlikely is going to happen, better to set it somewhere where the reader cannot check the occurrence against his own experience. And as such, the reader of science fiction is often estranged from the environments presented to them, whereas gothic fiction would generally create this estrangement by setting it in the past. Science fiction would merely move the reader to other worlds. It is also reasonable to accept that this is also done deliberately in Aldous's dismissal of many of the works of proto-science fiction having any relationship through history to the contemporary science fiction novel and the scientific romances of the 19th and 20th centuries. Because many of these works are contemporary in their settings, both temporal and physical to their writers' lives, there is no distance lending enchantment to the view, or at least not to Aldous, because these works of proto-science fiction are not contemporary to Aldous in the sense that they are not products of the post-industrial revolution period, he fails to see them as part of the science fiction tradition 
and are estranged to him for this reason. Aldous has also presented the opinion, in a more flamboyant definition, that science fiction can be described as hubris clobbered by nemesis, again a viewpoint easily identifiable with Frankenstein, but not necessarily so with a great deal of science fiction. In the late 1970s, Darko Suvin, the Yugoslavian-born academic and critic, was able to provide a definition for science fiction that seemed broad enough to incorporate most of the works in the genre, while precluding elements of horror and fantasy literature, which very often can appear similar to science fiction. It, science fiction, should be defined as a fictional tale determined by the hegemonic literary device of a locus and or dramatis personae that 1. are radically or at least significantly different from empirical times, places, and characters of mimetic or naturalist fiction, but 2. are nonetheless, to the extent that science fiction differs from other fantastic genres, that is, ensembles of fictional tales without empirical validation, simultaneously perceived as not impossible within the cognitive, cosmological and anthropological norms of the author's epoch. Science fiction is, then, a literary genre whose necessary and sufficient conditions are the presence and interaction of estrangement and cognition, and whose main formal device is an imaginative framework alternative to the author's empirical environment. The cognitive estrangement definition is sufficiently broad enough to encompass the more unusual works of science fiction. There is something inherently recognisable about the setting or world that the novel takes place in, something that presents the reader with a sense of familiarity based on the real world, yet at the same time there is something that sets the reader apart. In conjunction with this familiarity, there is some element, whether it is science, technology, language, gender, locus, or some other novum that estranges and separates the reader from the work that they are reading, and it falls within the realms of possibility or probability. The novum was the other term that Darko Suvin coined in relationship to his definition of science fiction. The novum is that new thing, the innovation that partly helps to provide the element of estrangement for the reader, though again it provides enough scope to ensure that the novum itself is not necessarily scientific or technological. A novum that is not technological could be, for example, languages created by authors for their science fiction worlds, such as the separatist teenage language Nadsat, spoken by the Drugs in Anthony Burgess's A Clockwork Orange, and Orwell's Newspeak in 1984, the intent of which is to restrict language sufficiently enough to prevent people's capacity for thought crime or social unrest. Science fiction is distinguished by the narrative dominance of a fictional novum, novelty, innovation, validated by cognitive logic. Suvin's definition, unlike Aldous's, is designed to include those works of proto-science fiction that existed prior to the Gothic tradition and even prior to the Industrial Revolution, but it is as much politically orientated as it is historical. Both Suvin and Aldous's definitions have come in for criticism over the years though they have remained the most stalwart of ships amid the stormy seas of ever perpetuating definitions. In particular, some criticism of their work in this area has been reasoned, but no other real definitions seem to be able to take their place. I think to most science fiction writers and critics, this is not as important to the genre as the fact that it keeps producing innovative, socially conscious work that looks to humanity's place in the universe and attempts to ask the old question, quo vadis? Gary Westfall's almost funny rant against the traditions of science fiction, as perceived by Aldous and Suvin, as well as others such as Brian Stableford, does little to change the perception that Aldous and Suvin's arguments are at the very least intelligent attempts to explore the influences and traditions of science fiction. Westfall's work on the true history of science fiction does much in the way of almost critical assassination of these two writers in particular, putting forward a very aggressive manifesto to discredit his peers' work. Westphal seems to dismiss both traditions, even holding the use of the word tradition in contempt, and ultimately seeks to put forward his ideas towards Hugo Gernsback and the development of the magazine era in the USA 
and suggests that these authors' much-respected works were an attempt by them at inventing science fiction, not studying it. This comes down to the mistaken concept that if a term such as science fiction did not exist before 1926 in Hugo Gernsbeck, which it did, though at this point Gernsbeck was using the term scientific fiction, then works in both these authors' historical traditions cannot possibly be science fiction. It is probably as daft in my opinion to say that history did not exist before the use of the word, or even that the earth did not exist until someone decided to give it a name. Westphal's particular attempt at wading into the history of science fiction does much to belittle the work of other writers. It brings the nature of science fiction criticism down to a juvenile level with which the genre was often associated with by its critics and detractors. Which view is correct? It's all matter of opinion. And the question of the true character and history of science fiction boils down to who is the biggest bully on the block? While Aldous apparently relishes that role, it does not constitute a sound basis for an examination of a literary genre. Westphal's remarks show the deep divisions within the science fiction community, however, which is why I think it's worth providing them here as an example. In this comment, Westphal's criticism to Aldous as a bully is in reference to Aldous's treatment of Lester Del Rey's opinions on science fiction being as old as literature itself. His only success in presenting his article is making Aldous, Suvin, and Stableford appear as eminently more respectable in their field, while making himself seem angry that he is not the biggest bully on the block. The discussions we've looked at present those arguments which are most generally accepted or regarded within science fiction criticism, with Mr Westphal's ideas representing a very different viewpoint. The debates, definitions and arguments over science fiction's history and its definitions as a genre are legion, and there is far from sufficient room to present them all here. They do, I think, show the nature of the beast as one that is not easily tameable or confined. I would suggest then that science fiction is a literary genre which has emerged out of the antecedents of fantastical literature and mythology, which were often attempts to explain the workings of the natural world when scientific knowledge was unable to provide reasonable evident answers, or was merely limited by the prevailing knowledge that existed at any given specific time. The distinct difference between works of fantastical literature which we can call proto-science fiction and the genres we know it today is that science fiction attempts to fundamentally explain and question the nature of humanity's place in the universe in a meaningful manner, using, though not exclusively, the tools of science and technology to explore, speculate and extrapolate on the changes humanity is currently passing through, whether they be social, economic, political, religious, spiritual, sexual, psychological or physical. Science fiction is in a sense the metempsychosis of humanity rooted in the present day, and through the development of what is in essence a postmodern mythology, attempts to understand the journey humanity is undertaking. It does so within the realms of reason and understanding, rather than through any mystical or divine rationale, and in that sense differs from fantasy and horror literature, where the rational world is set aside in favour of a locus which has numerous supernatural features. In that context, a science fiction work, although having elements of the fantastical, can be seen as having an expressed reality based within our current understanding of science in the natural universe, or reasoned speculation and extrapolation of that same understanding, whereas fantasy and horror literature can be seen to have little or no grounding in reality. It's finally important to know that science fiction is an umbrella-like genre, which seemingly finds it easy to encapsulate all other forms of literature a fact that I believe is intrinsically overlooked by the commentators of the genre, especially when they seem to spend more time suggesting what science fiction is not, rather than what it actually is. For that very reason, it is in particular difficult to define and identify, and fundamentally falls to the reader in their own understanding to realise that what they are reading is science fiction. Norman Spinrad pointed out that there is only one definition of science fiction that seems to make any pragmatic sense. Science fiction is anything published as science fiction, and this echoes Damon Knight's viewpoint, that science fiction is what we point to when we say it. It is for this reason alone that we know H.G. Wells as the Time Machine, and Jules Verne's De la Terre à la Lune are works of science fiction, no matter what anyone else may think. If this is the case, then surely those works of Lucian, Moore, 
Serrano de Bergerac, Kepler, Bacon, Swift, and Voltaire are also science fiction, even if only when they are recognised by their readers who understand them to be as such. Hi everyone, I'm Doc Sloan, and I'd like to thank you for watching my science fiction station. We'd love to hear your comments and feedback on our videos. If you enjoy the content, please give it a like, and if you're a bit of a fan of science fiction, we'd appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel and spread the word. Thanks very much. Bye bye.